Good morning, everyone. Good night to um, all of you who are in um, different time zones far away from us. It is uh, fantastic to have you with us, and we appreciate your dedication to the learning process. I'm very excited to um, introduce uh, the two people who will be leading the webinar today. And first, I will start with um, Andrew Nui, who um, many of you have uh, met already. Andrew is uh, a member of the Bootcamps team, and he plays an essential role on our team. And let me describe what it is. Andrew is uh, a uh, graduate of uh, the Bootcamp program. In fact, he is a graduate of the very first of the inaugural uh, Bootcamp, which occurred uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts in August 2014. And Andrew uh, came to MIT to the Bootcamp from Toronto, where he was uh, working for the Toronto Transport Authority as a wayfinding designer. Uh, he came with the intention of um, adding new ideas to his venture that he was building called Global Entrepreneurs. His intention was to create a global community that supported entrepreneurs wherever they are. And uh, ironically, this vision is alive and kicking, and it is alive and kicking as part of the bootcamp team. Uh, we, we loved Andrew's vision, and uh, we couldn't help but find a way to uh, cajole him to uh, move from Toronto to Boston and uh, join our team. And now Andrew is really the um, outward face of our team to, to the world. Uh, he understands the boot campers. Uh, he was a boot camper himself. And um, you will find in your interactions with him that this is a person who is not just deeply, I would say unusually passionate um, about uh, supporting entrepreneurs like you. And so uh, Andrew will moderate the webinar today with the entrepreneur Aman Advani. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Aman. Aman, um, I'm honored to, to call him a friend. I'm even more honored to call Aman a coach in the um, MIT Bootcamps program. Um, Aman is an entrepreneur who graduated from um, MIT Sloan and co-founded uh, the engineered apparel company, Ministry of Supply, about which you will hear today. And you will also hear about Ministry of Supply uh, uh, in the course of the online bootcamp in the module on pricing. But what I want to say about Aman is that Aman is a quintessential user innovator. By now you've gone through um, our uh, content on user innovation and you know that uh, user innovators solve their problems. And let me tell you the problem that Aman was solving. He was uh, a consultant who had to work very hard. And in addition to working very hard, he had to travel very often and look very good, look very formally and professionally. And uh, that was uh, very inconvenient. I think it's, uh, it, it's something that um, every, um, every consultant, every management consultant would relate to just the sheer inconvenience of formal attire when you have to work long hours and travel long distance. And so what Aman started doing actually, when you think about, think about the, the power of this small example and in the, in the small example, you find the germination of this very exciting venture. Uh, he started taking the bottoms of uh, socks, of uh, athletic socks, cotton socks, cutting off the bottoms of his professional socks and sewing the bottoms of his athletic socks to the tops of his professional socks so that the, the, the uh, flat part of the sock could be cotton and dry and give him extra comfort for, for work at night. Just think about it. The lengths to which he went, do you do that? Do you feel uncomfortable in socks? I felt uncomfortable in socks many, many, many times. I've never done that, right? So this is kind of the extent to which a user innovator can go. And in that, in that was the seed of the company of Ministry of Supply. Uh, Aman came to MIT with the intention of uh, continuing his venture there. Uh, he found teammates who also were passionate about taking engineered materials and bringing them to the field of um, apparel. And that's what they did. I will tell, tell you more because I want Aman to um, tell the story. But I think what's important to point out here is Aman's uh, case study will, will tell you about two things. You know, first of all, he's entering a mature market. How do you bring an innovation to an existing market? Generally, that is very hard. And generally that is very expensive because you have to invest to combat the entrenched competition. And he did it, so how do you do that? And secondly, a lot of you are challenged by how 
you articulate the value of your, of your innovation to your customer. In many cases, the value is intangible. It cannot be easily quantified. For example, what is the value of a Louis Vuitton bag? Can you really quantify the value of the bag? And in fact, this is the challenge that Aman faces because he is in the field of apparel. How do you quantify the value of a comfortable shirt? And in fact, I'm a proud owner of uh, shirts from Ministry of Supply. In fact, I am uh, a proud owner of pants from Ministry of Supply. This is not a uh, commercial that I'm doing. Um, <laughs> what I would like to say is that when I'm, um, when I'm dying, I would like to be buried in pants from Ministry of Supply because this is the most comfortable uh, pants for the long journey, um, for the long journey ahead. Uh, this is not a joke, seriously. Uh, this is going to be in my will. Please bury me in the uh, Ministry of Supply pants. But uh, Aman has to articulate, how do you articulate the value of a comfortable set of pants? Right? And so to, uh, to address these problems, Aman created actually, together with his team uh, at Ministry of Supply, a whole new methodology called quantified empathy. Just think about the power of the combination of these two words. Empathy and entrepreneurs thrive on empathy but not just empathy, quantified empathy. How do you achieve quantified empathy? And so I'm now going to turn it over to Aman to lead you through the process of quantified empathy. And we hope that you can learn from it and apply it to your exciting ventures. Aman, thank you so much for being here. Andrew, thank you so much for moderating. And uh, uh, first and foremost, thank you students for being here and for being on the learning journey. Aman, over to you. Thanks so much, Ardeen, and hello, everybody. I see there's uh, 86 people here and across so many different time zones. So this is super exciting to get to talk to everybody like this. I think the first thing I'll start off with is just such a huge thanks to Ardeen, to Andrew, and to the entire Bootcamps team. I think that um, having spent some time with the Bootcamp teams before, um, what many might not know that I get just a glimpse into is how much work goes into these boot camps, uh, how many months and, and just hours go into actually making these things come to life. So uh, um, cannot thank everybody enough um, and, and those that aren't on the call and, and Vim and, and the whole crew to say um, it's so meaningful to get to spend time with all of you and get to share our story. And, and my hope is that uh, you know, the goal for this session is one, to, to tell you more about everything our Dean said, quantified empathy and how that is very much our company's secret sauce. Um, but, but more importantly to say, I think everyone here is, as a boot camper has some aspiration to be an entrepreneur or as we like to call it an intrapreneur, right? entrepreneurial thinking, but inside of a larger cell. And so my hope is that through the presentation and, and some question and answer sessions that we'll do at the end, that you all get the chance to kind of see what our take is and how we did it and how we kind of got to where we are. And we still have a long way to build, but, but to get to this point, um, the style of thinking that we had is, I think, the only thing that differentiates us from a million other fashion companies. Um, to, to you all and, and to uh, specifically to Andrew and for having me here. Um, so what I want to start off with is a little bit of a background. I'm going to, I'm going to go and, 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 and again, much unlike some of your other sessions, I won't jump straight to the content. I'm going to share my screen here in just a second. What I'm going to do is actually start off with um, a little bit more about our company. I think that having that, um, or already have the greatest advertisement for our company. I'll give you another one just to start us off with because I think it's important to hear exactly what we're doing and why that matters to us. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Um, what I tell this presentation, how PMR is your secret sauce, because I think that's that's what we're um, that's what we're kind of proposing here. Um, but but the, the the kind of first concept I like to jump into, and hang on one second, let me make sure that this is uh, okay. Up, good. Um, that what what I, I I like to do is actually share a little bit more about kind of uh, before we get into this. What is you know PMR? Um, my company cares about certainly this quantified empathy theory is solving a certain problem, but we, we as a company are trying to fix fashion. It's such a major undertaking and, and, uh, and I'll get into why we're doing that in a second. But, um, you know, if you, if we go back and kind of look at the last, you know, couple of hundred years, right, we should understand this problem, not just in the last year, six months or six hours, but actually go back centuries. And, uh, and I've got here this first slide is, uh, is a picture of Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, 
um, well known to be a, a very well dressed person. He's actually wearing a suit right now from one of our competitors. Um, we didn't exist in 1865, so I don't blame him. Um, and it's, it's a company called Brooks Brothers, who's, who's quite popular here in the US. Um, he's wearing a Brooks Brothers suit in this, in this photo, as I understand. And, uh, and, and this was kind of what was traditionally thought of as fashion at that point, right? Suit and tie and, and kind of um, bespoke clothing and everything like that. So, uh, you know, he, he's, he's kind of this iconic statement of, of you know, 18, 19th century fashion. But if we look at what people are wearing today, it looks nothing like that, right? And when, when given the power of choice, um, this is just a little snapshot of what a new generation is starting to wear when they have optionality, right? Whether this is on Saturday or in some offices, what you might wear to work. Um, it's a trend kind of lightly termed athleisure. Um, you know, it's basically taking athletic wear and comfortable, you know, sweatpants basically and putting them in the real world. So I think this is what we want to wear. Um, then, then here's the question is what is, what is fashion doing to merge that merge what we have to wear with what we want to wear. Um, and the answer, as you can tell from this person here is nothing, right? So we're seeing, uh, this poor guy who's, who's what comes up when you Google search for, um, person with sweat stains, uh, his modeling career, I think peaked here, um, is that he, he's, he's got these massive sweat stains as a shirt that was probably dry cleaned. It's probably very wrinkly. It's uncomfortable. At the end of the day, this person cannot wait to get home and take it off. And so we're saying, well, well, we understand that we want to be wearing more high performance and comfortable clothing, but yet this is what we are wearing to work, right? And there's a, there's a, a women's equivalent, of course, um, to this male example here. And so the answer to that is saying, well, what is, what is fashion doing to solve this problem, right? If you look on runways of, of, of you know, uh, in Paris, uh, you get a sense of what fashion is doing to work on this problem. And a quick Google search yields not much, right? This is what fashion is doing to solve this problem. This is a bit hyperbolic and a bit of an exaggeration, but it's one of my favorite ways to say fashion tends to focus on the extremes. It's tending to focus on not the core problem of saying, how do we make this situation go away, right? This discomfort that we have in our wear to wear clothing. Fashion's instead focused on the art form. And, and, and my favorite is this person on the right who's wearing breakfast. Um, but you're, you're probably asking at this point, where is this presentation going and why does it matter? And ultimately, um, it's coming back to our company's thesis and saying, why does, why does ministry supply exist? What we exist to do is solve this exact problem. Um, and what you'll find is that over and over in this presentation, I'll come back to this word problem, problem statement or opportunity statement. Um, what you'll find is that we're going to go and spend a, a few minutes together now where I will very rarely, if ever, use the word solution. And in these boot camps, it's always my encouragement to ask everybody to just put the word solution away until, uh, or Dean and Andrew tell you otherwise, that you resist the urge to talk about the solution, talk about the problem. So in that way, uh, you know, fashion really just forgot to ask people what's the problem and, and whether or not we can fix it. Um, that the customer changed from 1865 in that first picture until today, the customer changed so much but clothing really didn't, right? That same Brooks Brothers suit is roughly still on the market today. That sweat stain ridden, uh, you know, gentleman that we saw a few slides ago is still very much wearing that shirt today. And what we contend is that there's a massive opportunity in the market, but that PMR is the only way we can realize that opportunity. And so I wanna jump into what Ministry of Supplies problem statement is. And this is a slide that we've built um, I think we probably built it four years ago, and that just stands to tell you that, that a good problem statement stands the test of time. So investing time and making sure that your problem statement is real um, and, and, and it is timeless and is, is, is relevant um, is super, super valuable. So we, like I said, we built this slide years ago, and it really hasn't changed. And what you can see highlighted there is ultimately our problem statement. All current clothing makes you choose between style or comfort leaving you either uncomfortable or inappropriately dressed, right? It's this trade-off between looks good or feels good. In Abraham Lincoln's case, he looked great. It was a very sharp looking suit. In the case of all the, uh, all the people you saw wearing sweatpants, they felt great. But in both cases, they didn't do the other one, right? Abraham Lincoln was probably fairly uncomfortable. And the people that were wearing joggers were probably not looking their best, right? They shouldn't show up to a, 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 a nice meeting or, or uh, you know, any kind of, business situation wouldn't be a good idea. And so this trade off, this ultimate kind of balance that people are always trying to strike between wearing what looks good or what feels good is, is Ministry of Supplies problem statement. And all of that to me is, is, is a precursor to this conversation because ultimately 
PMR only matters if you understand what you're trying to go at, right? So in our case, we started this whole company in 2011, 2012. We were saying, all right, we, we understand there's something going on in fashion, that there's a, an opportunity for fashion to advance, but we don't know what. Um, and so what we did is we turned to PMR. And what we did is we built this toolkit. And I encourage everybody here to create your own toolkit. Uh, we call that toolkit quantified empathy. But for the purposes of this conversation, it's identical to the PMR concepts that you're being taught in this boot camp. And PMR is, you know, in quantified empathy, as we call it, as, as our team previewed, is, is this kind of beautiful term that we love that combines left brain and right brain. It combines rational and emotional. As aspiring entrepreneurs, you are all probably constantly torn between this idea of, of the art form that you're pursuing and the rational exercise of building a business. And quantified empathy is, serves to combine those two. So what we do here is we built this toolkit and, and it's evolved over time to, to cover both proactive and reactive PMR. That means PMR that happens before we launch a product to, to create the product, but also PMR that continues during the launch cycle and after we launch it to iterate it and make the product better in a second, third, fourth generation. So uh, the pants that Erdine uh, recommended earlier that he said he wanted to get buried in, uh, those are on their fifth generation right now. By the time uh, Erdine is buried, those pants will have advanced them. So don't worry, Erdine, they'll become more comfortable. Um, and, and so this, this toolkit, now it's eight tools today. It could be 10 tomorrow and six the next day. It's not about how many tools we have. It's about the concepts behind them. And so we're going to get a chance to actually dive into them because my hope in this session is not that you just rip it off and screenshot it, which you're welcome to do but actually that you take the time to understand for your idea, for your business, for your problem statement, how PMR can be just immensely helpful to understand what it is that's racking around in your customer's brain, how they're thinking, how they're feeling, how they make decisions, how they perceive your product, how they perceive your solution down the road. We're not quite there yet, of course, but uh, initially how PMR can just be immensely helpful in de-risking your product by ensuring that you actually make something that they want. That in some cases they need right and by identifying that problem statement for pmr your risk is dramatically lower of putting a market on the product because you've created what we call market pull you've ensured that people are actually demanding wanting what it is that you produce rather than taking a guess producing something and then crossing your fingers as the alternative and so these eight tools combine for us to be this cyclical and you can see by the two arrows on here and they combine to be a cyclical set of, of tools we use on every single launch every single day. Some of them happen every hour. Some of them happen once a year. And so it's a mix of tools. Some of them, like I said, are proactive. Some of them are reactive. Some of them are continuous. Some of them are discrete. I think for the sake of PMR in this conversation, the easiest thing to do when in doubt is pick up the phone or walk over to somebody else in person. Um, all of these can be summed up by saying, have that human contact. The P in, in PMR is primary, and that means that you're doing it yourself. You're, you're having those conversations. The more of those conversations you have, the better and better your product will get. And so I'm gonna dive into a few of these uh, quickly. Oh, I didn't know we had slide animations. Great, um, makes it even more exciting. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on any one of these tools, but I do think it's important to go through our specific quantified empathy toolkit. And again, I keep on using the word our, because yours will be different. Um, it's important not just to take these as they are, but adapt them as ideas for how you can go and understand what is in your customer's head. Um, so first and foremost, this is my favorite one. It's called Wine and Dine. We took it from a company called IDEO who's been doing this, as I understand, for years. Um, it can be in small groups or it can be one-on-one. -on -one. You know, here we've got a description of this that has it as a small group. I also uh, have, have seen in many sources and through our own experience that doing this one-on-one -on -one can be equally effective because you remove group think. Um, the objective here, as it stated, is to unearth deep customer insights and behaviors in decision-making process. And it happens on a quarterly basis. And what we do as an example of this is we invite, let's just say 10 people to our office headquarters. We get them into a room where we have built a mock closet and a, a real bed and a mock closet and say kind of lay down on the bed and Pretend your alarm just went off. What does the next hour look like? Fast forward to it. How do you make decisions in the morning on what you're gonna to wear to work? Now that one hour of the day decides our company's fate in a massive way. And so understanding exactly what they're thinking is important here. Uh, the last time we did this, we figured out there, there were three triggers that make people decide what to wear in a given day. 
the first thing they did was check the weather. If it was gonna rain, if it was extremely hot, extremely cold. The second they, thing they did was check their calendar. And so 2A was what's the most formal meeting that I have today and you dress for that. And 2B is and what am I doing after or during work that's not work related? So can I dress for uh, drinks after work with a friend? Can I dress for a coffee date? Can I dress for a play date with my kids and another family? Uh, and so understanding these three inputs, the weather, my most formal meeting, and my other extracurricular activities that I'd have to dress for, we can then figure out, okay, well, we need to build product that fits those exact use cases. It's a cold day. Uh, my most ca you know, formal meeting today is quite casual, and I'm going straight home after work. Well, what is the outfit that we then build for that day? And so all of a sudden, we have a framework to build product around, right? We have a problem statement. It's a really cold day, and it's a really formal meeting. Is a tough combination we found because you want to dress nice, but you also want to dress warm, and those two don't often coexist very well. And so this tool has been just incredibly helpful for us to figure out how is your head working in the morning? What is, what is, what is that problem statement? What are those moments of conflict when you wake up and say, oh, shoot, it's raining, but I have a board meeting? Um, what are those points of tension that you have in your day that we can go out and solve? And so that's, again, where we create this problem statement of looking good and feeling good. The second tool that we use, uh, make sure my slides are working here. Um, the second tool we use is BioTests. So this is one, it's, it's an odd form of PMR um, that many of you may not need, but is very important for our business, is to understand how your body works understanding directly and very rationally in this case exactly how you expel heat, odor, moisture, pressure, uh, strain, how your skin stretches as you see there. Um, and what we can do there is, is actually we, we don't have to do this more than once a year because the reality is the information that comes out of here is quite timeless. So we only redo this when we need more information that we didn't actually see. And so we can do is actually understand through heat mapping where you expel body heat, right? Uh, where the hot spots on your body are or others. Um, when we're building socks, we looked, as you can see, they're pressure mapping to understand exactly where we should put pads in the footbed. Um, and by building this body of research, we now have a very undeniable source of truth that PMR can tell you, and this is very much a form of PMR to understand exactly how your body works in ways that you may not be able to articulate. How can we get to insights that you don't even know about yourself, but that we can find out through research and design? The third tool here is field testers. Um, this is a very one-on-one -on -one atmosphere. What you can see there is an example of field testers that we use for our women's pants launch about 18 months ago. And what we do here with field tests is very much a before and after. So at this point in our PMR cycle, we've developed a product. So it means we've already got a problem statement. We've hypothesized a solution and we've built that solution. And now we're using PMR a little bit later in the cycle to understand uh, exactly how people perceive our product. Did it solve the problem that we set out to solve? And so in this case, we're confirming using real world customers. So these are people that actually would be buying our pants. Uh, we build a small production run, 10 to 30 pieces in this case, and we've built about a dozen pairs. We sent them out to different people and we didn't give them any prompts. We said, just wear these and tell us what you, what you like and what you don't like. After a couple of weeks of wearing, washing, testing, we come back to folks and say, okay, let's see what you thought. And we have a, a set of questions that come up. We then, as you can see on the bottom, actually quantify it through uh, small scales, right? And saying kind of a zero to five scale, zero to 10 scale, um, even high, medium, low scales. Exactly what did you think of these pants in these different dimensions? We can then feed that back into our production process to make sure we fix anything that was broken and we keep anything that was great. Um, so again, this from a, from a time perspective is now we're starting to get just late pre-launch in our cycle. Um, again, for the sake of the boot camps, you will not have done PMR after your solution prototyping. Most likely your PMR will be happening in the ideation phase to help confirm or articulate a problem statement. This one to separate out is a form of PMR that's gonna happen after that phase, but is helpful to understand down the road. The fourth test we use is a labs community. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is one that you can certainly start to develop now for yourselves. Um, and what this is, and I, I don't have numbers on this slide, and I think it's important not to, because it can be a different amount of people. So in some cases, your community might be four or five power users. In other cases, I've seen communities built that are 100 or 200 actual customers on the market. But the idea is, it's a community of people that you charge with being available on demand, often online, but can also be in person. In our case, it's online for 
quick and easy questions to validate hypotheses that you have. Every time you have a bias or a hypothesis, it's a community that you can go out to and reach out to on short notice to understand, um, am I right? Am I thinking of this in a fair way that actually articulates your needs? And so what we can do here is to gain just a continuous cycle of consumer insights through this community. We can do it as needed or we can do it you know, on demand. We can do it periodically. We can set a weekly reminder to ask our labs community if there's anything here. Uh, and we tend to have this one open owned by a, a person on our team who's the head of operations who can pose these questions and curate to the community and, and actually manage this community. Now for your case to apply it to what you're doing right now, again, an ideation and problem statement generation, this community can be incredibly helpful. It's people who maybe use the incumbent. It's people who are using the product that you're considering replacing to understand what's wrong with, with the world they're living in right now. In our case, this early labs community with my peers at MIT Sloan who I knew were in consulting jobs and were wearing the type of wardrobe we were trying to replace or thought might be broken, I should say. And we would get 10 or 12 of them in a room, and this was kind of a very physical labs community, and just have open discussions with them on what they did or didn't like about their dress clothes today. And this is a really just open-ended kind of, think of it as a, a focus group, but with a bit of a, of, of a target, right? And so let's understand exactly what you do and don't like, whether it's color palettes, whether it's aesthetics, whether it's and feel, whether it's performance, whether it's sweat stains, dry cleaner, stuff like this that we can understand through this community very early on in the stage that you're at right now, just getting people in the room that were using the product or uh, area where we thought there was a problem statement to confirm or deny those hypotheses. Halfway through, we're, we're moving through here. Um, like I said, there's eight tools that we use. You may have one tool, you may have 20 tools, it doesn't matter, but I just want to articulate our eight. Uh, we're on to number five, which is my favorite one, and is one that I encourage everyone here to adopt as soon as possible. And this is really just as simple as documentation. We call it the spreadsheet. Now it's a bit more of a sophisticated tool, but in the initial sense, it was an Excel spreadsheet, which is I, I appreciated here having this as a Excel spreadsheet um, so that you could see this is something you could do tomorrow. And what this is, is just a constant record of all conversations we have with everybody over the course of time. So over the course of, in this case, now five plus years, we have this document that is now thousands of lines long, uh, this database. Uh, now the database, database has become more, uh, I'd say self-sustaining in the, in the sense that as feedback comes in, it's categorized and trends are actually highlighted. Um, so we see, for instance, if there's a quick spike in issues with socks, that we understand that maybe there's a production batch that had an issue, the, the spreadsheet, as, as we call it, um, will identify that. It'll tell you there's, a, there's an anomaly in the data. You're getting a lot of negative feedback on this particular SKU. You go address that problem. But early on, the spreadsheet was actually much less sophisticated. It was just a Google document that anybody on our team could contribute to. You could talk about where it came from. We can see the early days of, of this document here, the screenshots from, you can see 2016. Um, so this is actually a few years in, right, that we could kind of have, was it positive or negative? What product did it affect? Um, what subcategory, predefined set of subcategories we had. In your case, again, you won't have products, anything like that. In your case, it will be raw feedback that you can say, what area of our ideation does this affect, right? Is this, uh, is this important to us or not? Um, how do we understand this feedback and take it into consideration? So this one is just a scrappy, easy version that we threw together in an hour and ended up becoming one of the most impactful parts of our product development cycle. Um, again, in your case, where you're still in an ideation phase, you can very much use this spreadsheet um, and, and you can do so quite quickly and easily by just whipping this up in Google Docs and starting to collect all that feedback into one place that says, what did our PMR tell us? And that should never you know, die. I think that, that document should live on for years and years and years as it has in our case. Moving on to the sixth tool, um, conjoint analysis. This is a kind of a fancy marketing term. I'm gonna fly through this one because it's not gonna be that relevant to you right now. Conjoint analysis is something that helps a lot with design and pricing. How much do people value features that you're proposing? This is very solution oriented. So like I said, I'm gonna kind of pass through quickly. It's a way to isolate exactly how much people care about each of the features in your, in your proposed solution. But while right now we're still very much focused on ideation and problem statement generation, uh, this one's one to keep in your back pocket. It's a simple mathematical exercise that takes in uh, and tries to isolate the value of each feature and whether or not you should actually build it in your solution because people are going to pay for it or they're not going to pay for it, how much they value it, can you afford to make it. Um, but again, I'm going to fly through it because right now for you it's a little bit less relevant. 
Um, number seven here, user testing. Uh, there's a website here, as you can see, called user testing that we use. There are many easier ways to do this. Um, user testing is a form of field testing. As we said earlier, field testing was the ability for us to put product on the market. In your case, user testing might actually be pre-product, pre-problem you know, pre statement even. You can actually watch people user testing other products. So while I want to say in our case, we user test our own products, it is equally valuable to see how people test other products. So in one case, we look at a form of user testing, which is looking at Amazon reviews for incumbent products. Let's look at a dress shirt on amazon.com where reviews are easy to grab. Let's read all the one star reviews on Amazon and figure out exactly what people don't like about the incumbent. So again, this is problem statement generation, user testing. Um, in our case, we might take a, a bunch of Brooks Brothers dress shirts get a few people together, have them try it on actual user testing and say, what do you like about what you're wearing right now? What do you not like about it? And that user testing is again, a form of PMR for us that says, get that incumbent product on, understand exactly what you like and don't like and get that real primary data in um, Again, I think this is a good one for us. It's a little bit later in the cycle, but for you is very reactive, but one that you can use pretty soon here. And this is called Net Promoter Score. Net exception. We use Net Promoter Score to understand exactly how people are perceiving our products on a more emotional level. Net Promoter Score is a zero to 10 score people can give you and it's one question and it just says, how likely are you to recommend our product to a friend? Um, if you get a nine or a 10, you're considered a promoter. Anything from zero to six is considered a detractor, uh, which is odd, right, to say that a six on that answer is actually a detractor. And a seven or eight is considered neutral. And the promoter score is just a percentage of promoters minus a percentage of detractors, and it yields a score between negative 100 and positive 100. Again, this is the only survey that you'll find on here. I think that, that my encouragement, as you can see from tools one through seven, is to get out of your seat and make a phone call or have a real conversation and save surveys for kind of as little as possible given the amount of bias and the lack of humanity involved in survey. I think there are generally better PMR tools, although there is for a survey, as you can see, it is one of our eight. Um, so those are the eight tools we have, uh, and I, I'm see, seeing that uh, my, my time is getting a little bit short here, so I want to move through quickly the last piece of this presentation, which is kind of what you can take away from this. But for us, PMR is, I mentioned our secret sauce. These are four examples of ways that we take this primary data and we put it into action. Um, well, on the top left corner, you can see an example of a labs dress shirt that we made and we call it a zero gravity shirt. Um, that, that we figured out through primary market research early on the actual issues that people had with dress shirts. Now we make a full collection of men's and women's top to bottom. But I like to focus on the dress shirt because it was our first example of PMR when we were at your stage. We would just generate and understand exactly how much people disliked um, their dress shirts and exactly why we kind of poked into those answers. The second example you can see here um, on the top right corner is that no two customers have the same experience with their trends. And that through the spreadsheet here, what we can see is that the conditional formatting in the spreadsheet early on was our best friend. We could understand who was having positive and negative experience and exactly which, with which product. And because of that, we could see those trends, we could figure out where to focus, right? If you have three people complaining about a product out of 10,000, it's a lot less significant than six people out of 10. Um, and by using, uh, in this case, conditional formatting, those trends would get highlighted for us so we didn't have to dig through the data one by one to exactly what was working, what wasn't. On the bottom left, we have found over and over again, people are more open in person than digitally. So I you can see there's a heavy bias in my PMR presentation to just picking up the phone and getting off the couch. Um, when we have these sessions in person, it is remarkable what people are willing to open up and tell you about your competitors. Um, give it a shot and see what happens. Get on the phone and PMR can be just your, your greatest possi uh, possible friend. Um, and, and, and then the last piece here is just understand that PMR has bias, right? And so in our case, those bio tests are a way to make sure that people are telling us the truth because we're just scanning your body in this case to voluntary uh, um, people who, who are okay with this. Um, surveys tend to have a lot of bias. So that's where, like I said, we lean away from them. People even in person won't tell you. Uh, it's hard to get someone to tell you, I'm super nervous about sweat stains or I'm very anxious about odor. 
They're not things that people are comfortable with. So in, in some cases, we've designed PMR tools that are immune to bias because they're very objective. Now for you, I think that's a question that all of you can answer in your teams is, how can we remove or at least acknowledge the bias in PMR to make sure that we're you know, saying, even if people say they'll pay for something, how do we make sure they actually will? Um, that these are opportunities that you can think of on your end. For our case, it's a little bit simple. We can just use biology. In your case, it may be more challenging, but to acknowledge and understand that PMR. All these tools have in common is kind of like the prompt question that, that I have here. Um, and to kind of think about what your tool set might be. And I think we've got just a, a little bit of a simple um, PMR. Here, um, avoiding bias. I just mentioned this here, but in those tools, um, what you'll find is that you might try to enter these things trying to confirm your hypotheses. And I just say resist that urge as much as you can. Catch each other during teams where you see bias and you say, if you may ask don't you see that blank. Um, PMR requires you to be open-minded, open-ended, and just as open to the idea that your hypothesis is confirmed as it is that your hypothesis is denied. Those two are equally valuable. The second tool is, I say, mix it up. Many mediums, if you just have phone calls, if you just have surveys, you're not going to find a real balance. You won't find some data that conflicts, and you have to confront why the data conflicts across mediums. But if you don't have multiple mediums, phone calls, in person, small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, before launch, after launch, um, you know, online, offline, uh, survey, not survey, that if you don't mix it up, um, what you'll find is that a single type of PMR may yield a single type of response, but multiple mediums may yield um, trends or conflicts that you have to address. And the last one is somewhat obvious. I've said this, I think, 10 times. Just acknowledge and remember that real people are the only solution to good PMR. Um, you cannot just Google this and, and read about what other people have done for yourself. And I would go a step further to say everybody on your team should engage in some form of PMR. It shouldn't be one person that's then funneling, right? Because then that's where bias becomes very dangerous. Uh, at our company, every year, every single person in the company talks to real customers in an annual customer survey we do. Getting on the phone with about 15 customers per person, which sounds like, you know, a lot. That's doing real. Eyes is just cut down. So I'm um, a um, word solution, but the one word I kind of tend to just really stay away from here and say resist the urge to talk about the solution is to say in your PMR at the stage that you're at in the boot camp right now, just continuing to resist the urge to say here's a solution and asking a customer a question of saying wouldn't it be helpful if this existed, right? That you're right now still very much the idea of confirming a bulletproof problem statement that your customer may never hear, but that if you elicit what is really wrong or is really an opportunity in the market right now and resist the urge to just finding a solution, um, you're much better off than just proposing a solution and hoping that the problem is real. Uh, that'll cost you a lot of time, money, and stress to have a fake problem statement that was a product of you having a solution and backing into a problem statement. So I just say continue to resist that urge. Um, so this is kind of my, my parting thought. If there's one thing you remember from this presentation, it's to define a clear problem statement and use PMR to edit and confirm it. And I use the word edit as deny it or confirm it, right? That using PMR to understand we have this light hypothesis that something is wrong with fashion. It needs to be directed enough to know where to start your PMR. But what is wrong with fashion? What is wrong with clothing? Maybe nothing, maybe we're wrong altogether. Uh, maybe it's smaller than we thought, maybe it's bigger than we thought, maybe it's just different than we thought, but using PMR is your greatest ally in figuring that out. And then again, later on in the cycle, using PMR to continue to iterate that problem statement and the solutions that come out of it. But I want to talk uh, very, very specifically right now about how to actually conduct PMR in terms of the actual practice. Yep. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people are the early stage of PMR. The, the stage at PMR that you're at is probably not where uh, everybody's starting from because you have a, 
validated problem, you have customers, you have the viable opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of boot campers and learners out there are not at that stage. They don't know if this is a problem that needs to be solved, that needs to be validated. Um, they don't know if they have customers or if the market is large, market is large enough. Um, and they don't know if this is a viable opportunity. Can you share a little bit about the early stage of PMR um, and, and walk uh, everybody through that process of how you address that um, in very practical ways? Yeah, so, so I'll, 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 I'll answer that question through kind of our real life experience with this. And then I'd, I'd look back to you, Andrew, and, and our dean as well to, to echo more of the kind of uh, the, the academic perspective on how this might apply to others on this, on this meeting. Uh, um, what we did very early on, before we had a single prototype, before we had any idea what the product might look like or how it might feel, because we actually just started talking to people, right? I kept on coming back to this real people, not Google. And what we would do is we would go around MIT's campus, and I think here, uh, one of the greatest parts about this being an online boot camp is the decentralization of saying each of the teams in the boot camp have access to several different audiences, right? And so I think that's a huge opportunity that everyone on this call should take advantage of is saying that each of you will have access to a different set of perspectives from a PMR standpoint. So in our case, we were actually kind of a handicapped. Our entire team was at MIT and it was within E62, which is a Sloan building at MIT. We would sit there and we would find people that were wearing the clothing that we thought was broken. And we would literally just grab them. Um, now that they were kind of friends of friends, so I'm not talking about grabbing them in person, but I would say, hey, do you have 10 minutes for us to just ask you a couple of questions? I noticed you're wearing a Brooks Brothers dress shirt. I noticed that's you know, you, how you tend to dress. Do you mind if we pop you into this conference room and spend 10 minutes just talking about it openly, right? And we had a light structure to those conversations. What that evolved into is small groups, right? Let's get four or five people that we started to trust and understand that they had a real problem statement. Um, we would start to go into stores and say, you know, we would go into Brooks Brothers, we would go into Banana Republic, we would go into a Hugo Boss store and talk to the salespeople to understand what they thought, right? They were generally very open to discussions. Now, um, I think you have to be a little bit careful there because we didn't uh, we didn't completely share that our intention was to, to, to potentially produce a competitor and, and you know, we want to make sure we approach this ethically too. And so in hindsight, I think we could have certainly been more open about that. Um, but we would go into these stores, talk to salespeople and say, you know, what's your best seller and why, right? What are people liking about this stuff? And, and in what issues might I come across But we'd have conversations with people in stores we would watch customers shop in stores, right? We would be in those stores for a half an hour, 45 minutes at a time, shopping ourselves, but also watching how other people interacted with product. We noticed that people shopped with their hands. So the most important thing for us was the hand feel of product. And so I've given you a few examples that are all very pre-product and absolutely free. Uh, you know, PMR doesn't have to be expensive, where we just understood that what we wanted to figure out was here was the people that were making the product that we thought might be broken. We didn't know why it was broken, how it was broken. We didn't know if it was broken. We had some ideas, but we thought that they might be broken. And so what we did is we just collected up a group of different ways to figure out exactly what people thought about what was on the market today and how we might come in and, and change that. Awesome. The uh, question that VJ is asking here is, you know, when you're doing an interview for PMR, do you record the responses? Do you have one person? Do you have two people? You know, is that one person asking the question? And if it's just one person, do you record the, the uh, voice or video? Uh, are they uh, objective questions? Are they subjective questions? Yeah, that's such a good question. So uh, what, I would, what I would answer to you, Vijay, is that uh, what you want, to, in, instead of maximizing a form factor, what you want to maximize is the authenticity and the usefulness of the response. And so that can mean multiple things, right? I think in some cases, if you imagine somebody who is potentially a very vulnerable population, let's say you're asking questions about how people maybe pay for food that are in poverty, right? Uh, it's, it's a sensitive topic. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually sharing this as an example from a friend's company. Um, they didn't want two or three people in there. It became very intimidating to be a three-on-one interview that was heavily on note-taking. They wanted to feel generally anonymous. They wanted to feel very conversational. They didn't want to feel like you were taking notes and, and, and you know, using them as a case study or feel like a subject of a science experiment. So to maximize the openness in that conversation, it needed to be one-on-one, -on -one, no notes, no recording, in a coffee shop. And the setting was very important there. Now, after the session, the interviewer probably needs to one prepare ahead of time to make sure there's a certain structure they've got in mind. They need to get certain answers. 
and two right afterwards, jot down a bunch of notes. Um, but I do think a single repository for all of your PMR is important. We earlier mentioned it as our spreadsheet um, that's existed from pre pre launch all the way through today. Um, is subjective versus objective? I mean, obviously you want to get as objective as possible, but recognizing that entrepreneurship is an art form, there will be subjectivity as much as you can remove that bias or at least acknowledge your bias will be helpful. Um, but in asking questions about fashion, there will be naturally leading questions in there um, that, that are attempting to confirm or deny a hypothesis. So I think it's impossible to remove that entirely, but it's acknowledging that it's there. Thank you. Jay asked a question um, and it was more a clarification for the online lab communities. Would it be best to have multiple groups as a means to ensure sufficient feedback or um, do you just find one group uh, to be enough on its own? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, first and foremost, I should say that this, this group exists on Facebook. It's a closed Facebook group, um, which is just to me interesting to say everybody here, you know, of, of the 90 people in this session, I would imagine the vast majority are on Facebook. You already have access to this kind of community. Uh, it may not apply to every product here, or every problem statement that's being discussed here. But I would say that this, that the realization of this isn't some fancy, expensive, you know, community space. It's a private Facebook group. Now we just use that. We have one group. Um, the reality is mixing the mediums is more important than mixing Facebook groups. But that might not be true for you. You might need one that's specific to a certain topic and another that's specific to a different topic. It's two different groups of people. So I think that's very much up to you. What I'd say is just to continue during PMR to think of this as a continuous process and that it shouldn't be heavy or expensive, right? Creating a, a quick Facebook group, adding 10 or 15 people in that you think are qualified to discuss topics and prompting them on a regular basis shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be really heavy lifting. It should be something that you can do pretty easily. So I guess the, the, uh, there's another question here. Um, it keeps scrolling up. <laughs> there's a lot of questions I'm on. <laughs> well, good. Um, I don't know um, if so they did a good Rahul, job or a bad job, but I'm, I'm ready Rahul to answer. Is asking, do you incentivize your testers, lab participants, um, PMR candidates? Uh, what what happens? And is that something that you should be doing if you you know if at all? Yeah. So I mean, I think I think that'll be a per person, uh, you know, per problem, per person request. Um, I think in some cases you need to because otherwise people won't listen. We would often use five dollar Starbucks gift cards as a really small gift to people that would participate. Now, what I would say on the other side of that is to be very careful that it doesn't create bias, right? If your reward is your product, they're gonna be more anxious to tell you what you want to hear. And so I think kind of thinking about the incentives potentially backfiring on you, um, often we would give rewards at the end of the, the process to say thanks instead of saying, hey, 10 minutes for five bucks, you know, certainly we'll get more people in the room, but it might get the wrong people in the room. So understanding how incentives might actually change the answers before you throw blindly incentives out there. Um, I think you can also thank people on the other end of it, which is slightly different than an incentive is reward. Um, but in most cases, I think we were just constantly shocked about how open people are, how willing to discuss certain problems people are. Um, that was just something we, we, we didn't anticipate people wanting so badly to share what they liked and didn't like. I mean, people are really excited to talk about themselves and I think that's something that you should take advantage of. And that really demonstrates the point that it is a pain point. Say that one more time. So it really demonstrates that, they, you know, they really want to share uh, the, the issues that frustrate them, that these are actual pain points that need to be solved and that validates that it is a viable opportunity. That's totally right. When, when you get someone talking, the best kind of PMR, in my opinion, is one where you speak less than 10% of the time, right? If you get people talking, especially talking to each other, uh, the truth comes out, right? People are just so excited to share their thoughts and opinions. I think it's a daunting task at the beginning because people are kind of like, I don't want to bother somebody with these questions. I don't want to pull someone out of their day. The reality is uh, human beings have a tendency to really enjoy sharing their thoughts and opinions and talking about themselves. Well, we're all probably guilty of this. I think that people can take advantage of that and, and, um, and understand that it's, it's a win-win. They get the joy of venting and you get the joy of information. And Connie Joe is asking, is it a good idea to introduce a sample of the product during an interview? For example, have an interviewees evaluate look over a dress or a pair of pants? Again, I think, um, and please share more, I think it's really at what stage of primary market research that you're looking at, um, Aman. 
Yeah, Andrew, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you, you saw through my tools in some cases they were pre-production ideation, you know, pre-product, in which case you don't have anything to show them. Um, in some cases, it was to validate that the product we had made actually solved the problem or invalidate it in some cases. Um, you know, so in, in our case, a lot of that early PMR, that's probably the stage where a lot of the boot campers are at right now, um, was, was pre-product, right? We didn't have anything to show them. And I think that that's the most open-ended PMR you can get. Now, the second you introduce a product, there's an immediate bias in some cases towards the product because people want to make you feel good about yourselves. Um, I would say very early on PMR should be much more open-ended and should not involve a product or a solution, but down the road PMR can be helpful to validate or invalidate that the solution you've created is addressing the PMR problem statement you unearthed weeks, months, or years earlier. And um, let's see here, it keeps scrolling up, it's crazy. Uh, Giovanni is asking, so I, I think I want to preface the question a little bit. The, PMR process is qualitative, yet you're talking about the quantitative component of this PMR process. Um, he's asking, how do you leverage the data collected to identify possible patterns such as behaviors in the customers useful, that are useful to address uh, this whole issue of qualitative uh, uh, PMR uh, research? Yeah, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's how, how, do you, how do you kind of identify those trends and not noise? Yeah, so there's a couple ways I would identify doing this. Um, the more that you have multiple people conducting PMR, the easier it is to identify trends because the reality is your mind is going to be naturally trained to hear certain things and your partners and your teammates. I think one of the best parts about the online boot camp is that it's, it's team-based, right? You have you know, upwards of 90 people available to, to discuss with, if not a smaller team that you can certainly talk about with on a more regular basis. But if everybody on your team is, is conducting PMR, the trends become a little bit more apparent because you can discuss and say, hey, this came up for me out of the five conversations I had. It came up for me three times and everybody else in the call says, oh really, I didn't hear that once. Um, then maybe what you heard was just an, a, a bit of a bias or unlucky sample where that's actually noise, not information. And so what I say is that, you know, the, the more information you have, the more you can identify trends, but also the more mediums and the more people conducting the PMR, the easier it is to see those trends. I think the example I use in saying, is it three out of 10,000 or six out of 10? Um, those might look very similar because three and six are not far apart in terms of data points. But when you understand the denominator, it's a little bit easier to understand that three and 10,000 is a meaningless data point. Six and 10 is a very meaningful and so I think in, in identifying those trends, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the rules we come up with, we say the more data, the easier it is to identify a trend. Uh, and the more people that are chiming in here, and, and again, we use the, the spreadsheet to naturally identify trends. That's because we have thousands of data points. You won't have that. So a lot of your trend analysis will be through discussions and a bit more of an art form at this point. That's okay. As long as you find ways to remove that bias again through multiple data points, through multiple interviewers, and through multiple mediums. Great. Um, Paula is asking about the eight tools that you shared today that were very valuable in the information they collect. Um, how much time did it take you, you know, did you use all those eight tools? Um, how much time did it take you from the start of your PMR process to the time that you actually released the first uh, garment that you, you produced at ministry? Yeah, so I think, I think, and I think Paolo also asked a question earlier maybe about mediums and what, what the word mediums means, just to quickly answer that one. Um, mediums is, is channels, right? So it's in person or online or two different mediums. Uh, small group versus one-on-one, -on -one, that's two different mediums. So it's form factors, maybe another way to phrase that, Paolo, just to give you an answer there. Um, but the, the, so, so, so Andrew, can you just repeat the question one more time so I can make sure I understand exactly what we're going with this? Um, the question was there are eight tools that are valuable in the information that you co they collect. How did you use all of the eight tools? Which parts of the eight tools did you use in the initial stage uh, across the entire time that you conducted your PMR? Did you progressively use them? Just yep. trying to expand on that question. Where they came from, yeah. Yeah, and to the time that they, you actually released the garment. Yeah, so Andrew, your opening statement was, was, was spot on in the sense that you know, we're a, a, customer, a company six years in with you know, hundreds of thousands of units shipped. You know, we're in a very different position than a lot of the folks that are kind of just starting their journey now. Um, those eight tools have taken us six full years to create, and I'd say the graveyard is even deeper. Um, you know, the, the, the tools we're not showing 
doing here are even deeper, right? The ones that we, the mistakes we made. So um, I think in that way, we started off with a, probably a tool set that was probably more like two to three tools or formats or mediums um, that we conducted in that group. And some of those would have dropped off and new ones would have picked up. Um, you know, so, so I think in that, in that form, I, I think it, it, it don't feel that you have to go create this massive toolkit. I think my encouragement was captured in that last or second to last slide where I said it's real people, it's multiple mediums, and it's, and it's very kind of personal and, and humane that the, the concept behind PMR is what I'm trying to articulate more than the toolkit. And I think if you can remove that bias, have real conversations, mix it across mediums, you're, you're much better off. The so sh short answer is we, we absolutely did not have eight tools to start off with. And those eight tools have evolved on a daily, monthly, weekly basis in terms of what's most important in our design cycle at any given moment. Just aware of the really short time that we have left, so I'm really going to get focused on the questions that are going to be very, very practical. Donald is asking, PMR is best used as a continuous process. What would be some good signs that you have done a minimal viable PMR to start uh, working on a solution? Yeah, so I think there's, t there's two answers here, and the first one is gut. Um, there isn't a line that says, okay, you've now crossed the line, your PMR is completed. Like you said, it's a continuous process, those will continue to evolve. But at some point, if you really listen to your gut, we found that more than anything, right, quantified empathy is rational and emotional. Your gut is emotional, and it's something that I encourage you not to, 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 to deny, right, that your gut at some point will tell you, okay, we have sufficient information to understand that this is a real problem. It's slightly different than the problem we originally thought. Let's make sure we acknowledge and, and tweak that. I think we've heard this phrase, confront the brutal facts. Um, you know, when, when, when you're wrong, admit that you're wrong, call each other out. Uh, so I think that's part one of my answer. So I think these are kind of one, one is PMR done is, is your gut will tell you when it's done. And then I think the second part of it, uh, you, you, you answered the question by saying it's continuous. It's never done. Um, but you'll at some point feel like you have enough information to start acting on. Um, but the most important thing is to say, if you, de if you deny your gut or you deny sufficient information in this process, it is a very painful price to pay later um, because if you miss PMR and you don't do it right, you end up creating a product that the market doesn't actually want, um, which is the most painful possible thing you can do in entrepreneurship. It's create a product that you have to push because the market isn't pulling. And Ralph is asking a really, really interesting question. Have you ever seen a way to actually measure purchase intent? In other words, a solution or method to assess how successful a product launch will be in the market based on what customers say they would buy versus what they would actually buy. Yeah, I mean, for us, we're in a fortunate situation where we can make products relatively easy. And so the only way I can answer that question is by making them actually pay real money. Um, because the reality is I think you're pointing out the bias of people saying that they would be willing to pay for something versus actually pay for something are two different things. Um, so I think making sure that you phrase your questions correctly in a way that doesn't make them just want to validate what you can do. I think I can't speak to it too well because we're in a fortunate position where when we wanted to test those hypotheses, we could make batches of 15 or 20 and see if people would actually vote with their wallet or if they would say, yeah, I'm going to buy this online next week and then they never would. Um, so often that was validated early on. We sold those first stretchers for $129. We had 100 people commit to them, but I think only 10 of them actually kind of followed through and said, yeah, I'd buy one if you put that on the market. We put a, we put a, you know, a handful of dressers in the market and only a fraction of them followed through, which means that they were just telling us what we wanted to hear and that the dress shirt wasn't actually there. So we went back to the drawing board and designed around what, what they might want. So I think the only way to figure out if people actually spend money is by making them spend money and not feeling guilty that it's a half-baked prototype that they're spending money on. They're there to support you in most cases if it's friends and family and you can actually test that. But that's an evolving question that will just continue over time. And one uh, last point here, um, it's really a full on question on my part um, for, for you, Aman. Can you talk a little bit more about your most recent Kickstarter uh, project? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a clear example of, hey, if you put your money where your mouth is, really. Yeah, that's totally right. So this was, a, it was a wild one for us. We made a heated jacket that has machine learning algorithm to actually change the heat based upon your preferences. So as you change the heat settings um, over time, exactly like a Nest thermostat, the jacket will adjust. So I'm sharing the solution with you, but PMR was critical to this. So as we went through, it was actually a few 
field tester. Um, uh, so, sorry, it was a wine and dine, the first tool I took, where the, the early on where people said it's in your office. And so many times people kept on bringing up the Nest thermostat. And the thermostat, uh, you know, different people in the office have different preferences. And I hate my office. It's always so cold. I hate my office. It's always so warm. You know, you have a thermostat, which is building a temperature setting for many people that is broken. We said, what if we could create a personal thermostat? What if you could create a microclimate, right? And so what if you could say, hey, I'm, I, I run hot. I, you know, I don't want anything that's too hot. I always want the office to be a little bit cooler. Um, this applies not only to the office, but the, the inside applies to your entire life. That there are people who run warmer and cooler and that never, never was the same. And so we created this jacket with effectively a Nest thermostat built into it. So I could, you know, we could be standing at the same bus stop side by side, but because of our different preferences, the internal temperature is different, the external temperature is different, and our motion is different. We have three sensors built into the jacket to understand all that data. With those three data points and your preferences, we can learn exactly what your heat preferences are and, and adjust the jacket automatically. And so it was a classic example of PMR driving a real problem statement. You know, pe different people have different, you know, thermostat needs, different climate needs um, that generated the problem statement that, that we used as a starting point for product development and created a product that, that did quite well. We ended up selling at this point about a million dollar product over the last uh, three months or so. And, um, and, and it just to us validates the problem statement was real. Now those are pre-orders. So in November, when we ship the product, we will be able to officially confirm that we did did solve the problem, although all of our field testing of the actual product prototypes in house have confirmed it to a sufficient degree where we were able to click produce. But it's a good example of real PMR yielding real problem statement, yielding a real product. Aman, I want to thank you for your time. It's been such a pleasure having you on our e seminar series again. And as a coach, uh, it's been invaluable. Thank you for your time. Thank you, students, for joining us today. And we will be having more in the coming months. So stay tuned. Again, have a great day and we will see you soon. Bye now. Thanks so much. Bye guys.